Hello. The purpose of this 10-minute presentation is to provide an introduction to the law of the sea through the idea of zones of maritime jurisdiction. So in this first of three screencasts, I'll be focusing on zones under territorial sovereignty, internal waters and the territorial sea. But I'll also be providing an introduction to the idea of zones of jurisdiction and maritime zones in general. So let's start. The first point to note is that while we commonly say that the oceans cover two-thirds of the world's surface, much of that water space falls under national jurisdiction. However, as we'll see, jurisdiction is not the same thing as sovereignty. This is a point we'll really pick up in the second screencast. Jurisdiction may confer limited rights to regulate particular subject matters, such as fishing or drilling for oil. And that doesn't necessarily mean you need full sovereignty over an area to control those activities. The point is that coastal states have different powers in different zones of the ocean. In some areas they have full sovereignty, in others they have only particular rights or particular forms of jurisdiction. So here we have an idealised or stylized map of maritime zones and we can see that there's a 12 mile territorial sea, 12 nautical miles out from the baselines of the land. and state authority over land and the territorial sea are largely considered to be legally the same, subject to a few exceptions. Hence the phrase territorial sea. Control over the territorial sea derives from control over the land. Then we have other zones of national jurisdiction, the contiguous zone and the exclusive economic zone that are adjacent to the territorial sea. And beneath that, the continental shelf the natural prolongation of the state's land mass over which the coastal state will also have rights. Then we have the areas beyond national jurisdiction, the water column, the high seas, and beneath that, the deep seabed, what's known in international law terminology as the area. The essential point though here is that in general, states have jurisdiction over a variety of economic activities out to 200 nautical miles from shore and may have rights over the seabed, the continental shelf, some distance beyond even that. But what this means in practice is that much of the oceans are subject to some form of state authority. So we have here a map prepared by the National Oceanography Centre of the University of Southampton that shows in light blue the areas generated as 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zones. And these will extend a long way from the coast, or what we might think of as the coast, where there are islands that are also capable of generating those zones. The orange areas indicate potential continental shelf claims that extend beyond those 200 nautical mile limits. And this light blue area is the area of the high seas, which just because it's not subject to national authority in a direct sense doesn't mean it's free from rules of law of the sea and we'll come to that in the third of these presentations. So we're not going to be talking here about the law of the continental shelf except in so far as states have jurisdiction out to the 200 nautical mile exclusive economic zone limit which exists irrespective of whether there is actually a geological continental shelf there of the type depicted here or not. So let's talk about maritime zones. Now if we were real, using real charts this could become a little bit complicated but instead we're going to use a sort of simplified whiteboard diagram of mine. So here in black we have a line indicating land territory and a dotted line indicating what's sometimes called a closing line across the mouth of a bay. So inside as it were the land we have bays, ports and harbours forming internal waters then other zones are measured from a state's baselines. We can normally think of this as being the low water mark of a state, but uh, as the dotted line suggests here, there are situations where a coastal state might draw closing lines or straight baselines according to special rules we won't be covering in any detail. So in these presentations, we're going to be looking at the 12 nautical mile territorial sea, the contiguous zone that goes out to 24, nautical miles, and then the exclusive economic zone that goes out to 200 nautical miles from baselines. So each of these distances is measured from the baselines, not from each other. And then beyond the area subject to national jurisdiction, we have the high seas. 
So let's talk then about internal waters and the territorial sea. When we talk about internal waters, this is the sort of situation we're thinking about, ports. We're talking about waters within those baselines we've described, harbours, bays, ports, rivers and so on. And the essential question is the extent of coastal state jurisdiction over foreign vessels that have entered these internal waters. And when it comes to ports and internal waters, we can say that there's a basic rule. The internal waters are subject to the full sovereignty of the coastal state. This means that coastal states may regulate access to ports and impose conditions of access and then enforce them, meaning they can enforce their law against visiting vessels. So this also suggests that the coastal state has no obligation to let an individual ship into port. However, ships in distress have a right of access to port. So a ship in distress is one where there are concerns about safety or where there are threats to human life. Uh, the vessel may be unfit to proceed. And that right of access, however, does not encompass a right to disembark passengers. So it's a limited right. Moving out from internal waters, we're then looking at the territorial sea. And as I've already indicated, this phrase territorial sea indicates this is a zone of sovereign jurisdiction. So a coastal state has sovereignty over its territorial sea. However, it's not a sovereignty of quite the same type as it enjoys on land, because its control of the territorial sea is subject to the rules of innocent passage. What do we mean by that? Ships that are simply passing through the territorial sea will have a right of innocent passage. We'll come back to what that means. But because it only applies to ships in passage that are moving through the territorial sea, ships moving inward towards port or outbound vessels that have been in port are subject to the criminal jurisdiction of the coastal state. In that sense, entering the territorial sea, if you're inbound or outbound, is the same as entering territory. You are subject to the criminal law enforcement jurisdiction of the coastal state. But even despite the limitations of the innocent passage regime, the coastal state can still act regarding matters such as safety and traffic separation, so designating sea lanes through the territorial sea for safe navigation, fishing, it can prohibit fishing in its territorial sea and take measures regarding environmental conservation and its customs and immigration law. So ships are not entitled to violate these laws while in the territorial sea. The right of innocent passage in the territorial sea is an important one. It is extensively covered in the Law of the Sea Convention in Articles 17 to 32. So what does that mean then? Innocent passage allows a right of navigation. As we've said, it allows you to pass through the territorial sea. But that right can be lost if non-innocent acts are committed, which means the really important question is what acts in this context are not innocent. So there's a list in Article 19 of the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, and it includes things like various military activities, any exercise with weapons, certain acts of information gathering, any form of fishing, research or survey activities examining the seabed, and then this very wide category, any other activity not having a direct bearing on passage. So the point of innocent passage is it's just that. It's a right of passage. It's not a right to perform other acts the coastal state might expect to be allowed to regulate and therefore innocent passage must also be continuous and expeditious. You are not meant to stop and hang around, hover in Law of the Sea terminology, except in cases of distress or if you're rescuing another vessel in distress or if it's simply not your ordinary mode of navigation to proceed at night, so certain small vessels might not be safe to proceed at night if they have only one crew member and limited navigational equipment and so on. This leads us, though, to one of the major controversies about innocent passage. Do warships have a right of innocent passage? Having foreign warships within 12 miles of your coast may seem somewhat threatening. So states have been concerned about this as a concept. So what does the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea tell us? Well, it doesn't expressly say warships enjoy a right of innocent passage, but it does say that the rules of innocent passage fall under the heading rules applicable to all ships. Further, some of the non-innocent activities that could lose you your right of innocent passage are clearly military in nature. So all of this suggests that warships do have a right of innocent passage. Some states, however, require prior notification of 
foreign navies' warships if they intend to transit the territorial sea. However, a requirement of prior notification is not the same thing as requiring consent for them to enter the territorial sea. So it's asking, tell us when these come, not saying you can only pass through our waters if we consent, which is potentially an important distinction. Finally, though, there might be circumstances where a coastal state wants to exercise law enforcement jurisdiction over a vessel engaged in innocent passage. Can it do so? Is innocent passage a complete immunity from coastal state jurisdiction? Well, the basic rule set out in Article 27 of UNCLOS is that coastal states generally should not exercise criminal law enforcement jurisdiction over vessels simply passing through their territorial sea. But cases where it may do so include crimes committed aboard a vessel that disturb the peace and good order of the coastal state or the territorial sea. So this will normally involve acts extending beyond the vessel in some manner, such as discharging a firearm against another ship in the territorial sea. Warships, however, are immune from this criminal law enforcement jurisdiction because they're warships. They're an emanation of the sovereignty of another state and enjoy sovereign immunity. So that completes our quick tour of zones under sovereign jurisdiction, the idea that there are sovereign rights out to 12 nautical miles. Later presentations will cover zones of jurisdiction only and the high seas. So in the next instalment, we'll be talking about the contiguous zone in the EEZ. I've described them here as zones of jurisdiction only. That's not entirely accurate, as in the EEZ, coastal states also have certain limited sovereign rights. But we'll come to that next time. Thanks for listening.